This is part two of my lecture on black political life in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, so I'm going to focus in this part of the lecture on two major leading intellectuals of the black community, two men who articulated very competing messages about how the black community could deal with racism. Booker T. Washington, pictured here on the right, and W.E.B. Du Bois on the left. Booker T. Washington is best known for his promotion of accommodationism, while W.E.B. Du Bois is best known for his advocacy of black civil rights. I'll start with a brief biographical sketch of Booker T. Washington's life. His background provides some insight into why he adopted an accommodationist politics. He was born into slavery um, as a slave in 1856 to an enslaved mother and an unknown white father. His life uh, was a life of hard work. After the Civil War, he and his mother moved to West Virginia where, as a child, Washington worked in the salt mines. Always dedicated to education, after work each day, he would attend a few hours of school. When he heard about the Hampton Institute, a historically black college founded in 1868, Washington literally walked 500 miles to enroll. Once at the Hampton Institute, he took a job as a janitor to pay for his room and board. The Hampton Institute was dedicated to vocational training. Students learned things like um, how to manage crops, how to become expert cabinet makers. They developed uh, expertise, technical expertise in agricultural production and so on. He became a protege of the school's principal while a student at Hampton, um, you know, and the principal helps uh, Washington to establish his own school, the Tuskegee Institute, which he's most famous for. Founded in 1881 in, um, oops, I guess, okay. Founded in 1881 in rural Alabama, the Tuskegee Institute modeled itself after the Hampton Institute. Washington started Tuskegee by first buying land, and then he found some students who literally built the school from the ground up. Tuskegee, like Hampton, promoted a vocational education for black youth. It was sort of um, education that prioritized intellectual and cultural learning wasn't a priority because the idea behind Tuskegee was the promotion of individual advancement within the confines of Jim Crow segregation. In other words, Washington was clearly recommending to the black population that they accommodate themselves to Jim Crow by trying to work within the system to advance themselves rather than against it in its entirety. I think what facilitates this politics um, is his reliance on both state funding and uh, funding by white northern businessmen who agreed that black people in the South should focus on bettering themselves economically in this limited way. In other words, Tuskegee was training workers who would be ideal for white-owned factories. Okay. With Tuskegee um, as his base of operations, Washington emerged, emerged as a very influential spokesman and educator for the black community. In 1895, he delivered a speech at the Cotton States um, and International Expo Exposition in Atlanta to a largely white audience that captured his political approach. I'm going to play a brief clip of this speech in class rather than um, online so that you can, um, it's kind of, the quality is going to be kind of bad, but you'll at least you'll be able to hear uh, Booker T. Washington's um, voice. So we're going to return to a discussion of this um, in class, but I'll say a few things about the speech. So uh, the speech re revolves around the phrase, cast down your bucket where you are. So quote, cast down your bucket where you are. Washington is telling people gathered, business leaders trying to raise money to improve the South in economic terms, that they need to trust black people to do the right thing. He's telling the white industrialists, so businessmen and agriculturalists, that um, you know, you're trying to import immigrant labor to do this labor, to do this work. Um, he's saying, don't do that because you can trust black people to work hard to not form unions, to resist unjust treatment, and so on. So it's actually a nativist or anti-immigrant argument, right? So don't hire immigrants uh, because they um, are troublemakers. They're going to form unions and, and resist you. 
Um, but it's also, you can see in some ways, it sounds um, anti-black because it's saying black people will be loyal and won't resist in the same ways. Um, so he says in the speech, quote, we've proved our faithfulness in the past. Past. We've proved our faithfulness in the past. It's interesting because this is a reference to slavery. So he's saying black people won't resist because we've proved our faithfulness in the, in the past as slaves. He's uh, portraying black Southerners as loyal and patient. He's encouraging them to begin at the bottom of life. And he's calling black agitation for social equality extremist and concludes that, quote, in all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one as the hand in all things essential, essential to mutual progress. So this is a justification for segregation um, just the year before Plessy v. Ferguson, which is the Supreme Court decision in 1896, Right, which says that uh, segregation is perfectly constitutional, does not violate the U.S. Constitution. But many people viewed Washington's speech as masterful because it allowed different audiences to hear what they wanted. Most important for black people were the elements of hope and possibility for a brighter future. So this emphasis on self-help and economic uplift was actually pretty popular. Uh, by contrast, most white people appreciated Washington's accommodationism or his approach to working within the racial status quo, including within segregation. So the alternative to Washington is embodied in W.E.B. Du Bois. Prior to his death in 1915, Booker T. Washington was perhaps the most, um, the more well-known and influential of the two. But Du Bois played a central role in black political life for 60 years and was very, very influential throughout his life. So way past Booker T. Washington's death. Du Bois criticized Washington for his call um, that uh, black people should give up their demands around political rights and higher education. He referred to Washington's speech at the Cotton States and International Exposition in Atlanta as the, quote, Atlanta, Atlanta Compromise, and denounced its main premise when he said, quote, Manly self-respect is worth more than land and houses, and a people who voluntary, voluntarily surrender such respect are not worth civilizing, unquote. He's essentially saying, if you don't have the courage to stand up to the system that's pushing you down, you're not worth, quote-unquote, civilizing. His reference to manly self-respect indicates a gendered concern about inequality in the black community, he was particularly concerned about the degrading effects of discrimination on black men. But he's not the opposite of Washington. Um, the two men actually had um, some things in common. They both promoted a racial uplift ideology. They both emphasized the importance of racial solidarity in the black community. And they both thought that economic advancement and hard work were important. Uh, du, Bo uh, du Bois believed though in higher education he thought this was key in uh, the pursuit of racial equality and believed that the top 10% or the talented 10th, that, you know, Henry Morehouse's um, uh, phrase. So the, the talented 10th of the black population would lead, would help lead the black population to freedom. So to summarize, the key differences are with regard to education and the question of political equality. W.E.B. Du Bois is more of an activist. A closer look at W.E.B. Du Bois's background tells us something about why he developed his political ideas. He was born in 1868, died in 1963. Oops. Um, he was born in a small black community in the mostly white town of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. He received his undergraduate degree from Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, so a historically black college. Fisk University, um, and another undergraduate degree and graduate degree from Harvard, including his PhD in 1895. So he is among the very first generation of black people to get PhDs in the United States. He was trained as a historian, but he helped found the field of urban sociology. In the early 1900s, Du Bois taught at Atlanta University, where he conducted a number of um, path-breaking studies of black life. So as you can see, he embodies the role that the black intellectual would play in saving the race. He 
also had a pretty big ego. He really believed that politically engaged scholars, you know, associated with the university, writers, scholars, were the best people to interpret the white world. One of the insights he was most famous for was his discussion of the veil that separated the races. He said that black people wore a veil that kept them hidden from view from the outside world, but the veil allowed the wearer to see the world as it was. And this was the special gift of black America. Um, so they could see America the way that whites simply could not see it. This peculiar experience gave black people what he called a double consciousness. So this is a, a long quote from um, The Souls of Black Folk, a book uh, written by W.E.B. Du Bois, published in 1903. Quote, after the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and Roman, the Teuton um, and Mongolian, the Negro is sort of a seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. The history of the American Negro is the history of his strife. This longing to attain self-conscious manhood to merge his double self into a better and truer self. So W.E.B. Du Bois was involved in many different developments in black history, including um, he assembled an exhibit for the 1900 black, uh, the, sorry, the 1900 Paris World's Fair that summarized black people's achievements since emancipation. He was involved in uh, Pan-Africanism, which was this idea that black people in and outside of the African continent shared a global sense of African identity, as well as an abiding concern for the welfare of African Americans el uh, everywhere. Um, he was perhaps most famous for two of his efforts, though, the Niagara Movement um, and the founding of the NAACP. So in 1905, he helped to launch the Niagara Movement, this militant protest organization consisting mainly of black intellectuals and professionals, most of whom were men, as you can see in this image. The meeting in 1905 that launched the Niagara Movement uh, met on the Canadian side of the, uh, Niagara Falls because New York refused them lodging. There was nowhere to stay that would allow black men right, to lodge. The movement was um, dedicated to full citizenship rights for African Americans. It called for equal educational opportunities, voting rights for men, respect for working people, and the abolition of all distinctions based on, ra uh, on race. So the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, so the, uh, the Niagara Movement uh, met regularly until 1909. Then there was a race riot in Springfield, um, Illinois, the hometown of Abraham Lincoln, which grabbed the nation's attention in 1908. So what happened? A white woman accused a black man of raping her. She later recanted the story, this has been the case repeatedly in US history, and admitted that her white boyfriend had beaten her. But in the meantime, angry mobs formed to look for the black, the black perpetrator, um, and they started attacking black people indiscriminately, who they said must be harboring the, race, the rapist. Horrified, a few white liberals, many of whom had their roots in the abolitionist movement, organized a conference that um, and invited members of the Niagara movement as well as other black activists. W.E.B. Du Bois uh, was one of the people who attended and together they decided to form a new organization, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1910. It was interracial, but at its conception was white dominated. In fact, uh, du Bois ended up being the sole black officer of the organization at its founding. In time, it became the nation's leading African-American civil rights organization, involved in civil rights struggles throughout the rest of the 20th century and into the 21st century. It's still around today. 
By the 1920s, the NAACP became an overwhelmingly black organization and was involved in uh, the court system in particular, uh, trying to end um, housing discrimination. It was involved in efforts to get Congress to end lynching in the United States. You know, it had some success in housing, not much, uh, but Congress did never pass an anti-lynching bill, one of its main um, goals. So as the NAACP's Director of Publicity and Research, Du Bois edited the organization's journal, The Crisis. Under the, his direction, the journal circulation grew from just 1,000 in 1910 uh, to 100,000 just nine years later. It was also one of the longest running black newspapers in the US. So the crisis is one part of a larger important history about the central role of the black press in black life and civil rights struggles. This slide just has a couple of uh, books that I would recommend, The Souls of Black Folk, which I took a quote from, as well as his book, Black Reconstruction in America, 1860 to 1880. I'll stop here and just reiterate, as usual, um, the argument that I started this lecture with. Um, though the late 19th and early 20th centuries represented the nadir or the worst part of the post-emancipation black experience, there was hope that grew out of despair. There was hope in the everyday acts of resistance by the black population in the South, as well as in the North. We also see the growth of black civil society of churches and associations of educational institutions and political groups engaged in a broad project of racial uplift. So this was a, a complex, multifaceted movement that had its conservative elements as well as its, as its uh, more radical or sub, uh, subversive elements.